If this is your first time with us, we are thrilled that you're here, and I hope that you'll come by and say hello and introduce yourself to us afterwards, uh, after we speak for a few moments on the text that we're going to study this morning. There are actually two of them. One of them was read uh, just moments ago by Brian, and we're going we're gonna to read a similar text, the same text, just in a different version, and that's where we'll begin this morning. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die, but God demonstrates His own love for us in this, while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? Let's pray as we begin this morning. Father God, in the next few moments together, I ask that You would bless us, God, Lord, myself, and those who are listening and learning alongside, that You would help us to understand in greater measure Your purpose in the gospel and its place in our lives. We ask you this in Jesus' name, amen. There is probably no simpler mathematical equation than that of one plus one equals two. It is a foundation on which we apply numerous mathematical principles. Neil, when earlier you converted 10,000 bags of gold into over $1 billion, you used in some measure this foundational principle. And often when people want to convey the idea of something in its simplicity, they'll say something like, you know, one plus one equals, because who could miss that? Who, Who could ever misunderstand that question? If you have one apple and someone gives you another, now you have two. And by the same logic, if you have two and someone takes one away, you now have one. It is a universal fact of life that transcends barriers like language or race or culture, which makes the following fact all the more astounding. The mathematical proof for one plus one equals two is 360 pages long and was not conclusively proved until the 20th century. Uh, Lest you think that that's a joke, this is the book that that proof is found in, Principia Mathematica, written by a British mathematician named Bertrand Russell, who set out to conclusively prove that mathematics worked, and so he decided to start with the very simplest concept we know. The 20th century seems kind of late to be proving one plus one equals two, right? I mean, there were some rather huge things resting on that principle. International economies and uh, uh, governments, uh, engineering. What what happens if we conclude that one plus one does not equal two in the middle of the 20th century, right? Uh, It would just blow everything up, right? Things could just be falling on our heads. Money, we might as well just eat it because one plus one no longer equals two. All that to say, the whole idea is very simple, and it's simultaneously rather complex, even if you can't really wrap your minds around it. This this is why I don't really do math. Consider also the English word, the. Uh, By the way, that is, uh, we'll we'll get to that in just a moment. Consider the English word, the. It is the most prominently used word in the English language. It accounts for 5% of every word that is spoken in the English language. But how would you define that? Uh, So, a little social experiment here. I want you to take 15 seconds, 20 seconds. I've already done this myself. I want you to turn to the neighbor that you're with, whoever you've come with. I want you to define the word the, okay? Go.
three. The, T-H-E, for those of you who are academically challenged. Now, we, I hear lots of conversation, though not, not a lot of conclusiveness. Uh, I did this myself, and I concluded that the word the is an article of specificity and exclusivity. Now, that's my, that's my definition, right? Uh, yours probably differed in various ways. If you look in Merriam-Webster's Webster's dictionary, you will find that there are four entries for the word the and approximately 30 different examples of how it can be used. It's a very simple word, but defining it is actually quite complex. Uh, Ange is in the final year of her online classes at Southeastern University. She will graduate in the spring with a major in business. I'm hoping she can fix this economy. And, and when in the midst of all these courses, she takes electives. She has taken one course recently dealing in literature. I have an interest in literature, and she's come to a section on poetry, and so I've started reading some of these poems. And I find poems, much like the word V or the mathematical equation 1 plus 1 equals 2, to be fairly simple and then simultaneously complex. And when I think about those things, I'm reminded of the gospel, which is simple enough that any of us can understand it, and yet simultaneously it's complex enough that God is doing different kinds of things within it that each of us needs to grasp and understand, whether we realize that those things are happening to us and within us or not. On the one hand, the gospel is a very simple concept, that Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, died in our place on the cross as substitutionary atonement for our sins, reconciling us to God and bringing us back into right relationship with Him that was ruptured in the sin of the fall. This is the gospel. We should have died. He died in our place. This erases our sins and brings us into right relationship. But within that simplicity, there's a whole lot going on. And so we are going to spend the next five weeks talking about the gospel, various aspects of the gospel, and what Christ did on the cross, and what that says for me now and in the future. And so that's where we're headed for the next month or so. I went to get gas on Friday not thinking about what I was doing and wound up stuck at BJ's. Could hardly get in and couldn't get out because of the chaos that had ensued because of a cone that looked as if it was go were going to envelop us. And so I took that opportunity to go ahead and get gas because why not? I might as well do what everybody else is doing it and got gas and returned to the church after what probably took me 45 minutes and just marveled at the chaos that was already beginning uh, from the people that were just terrified of the incoming storm. Um, certainly, those things are to be taken serious, and we take them seriously. And we will afford you opportunities here at the building if, if ever you were to need that. We take those things seriously. Um, but as I have thought about this series in the last several weeks, I have uh, been very aware of the chaos that exists every day in life, whether it be through nature or through mankind. I, am a, I would consider myself a family man, like many of you would. Uh, I love my family. I enjoy being home. I find that many of life's greatest lessons are learned within the context of being in family. Uh, my family is a priority to me. The vast majority of, being, uh, of the time that I'm in family, it is a blessing. There are, there are only a few times where there are difficulties. There are the times where we have discipline or accidents that are just normal parts of life, but almost all of it is great. There is one day every year I have come to despise. We call it Family Picture Day. <laughs> family Picture Day is the day that Doug and I equally despise. Um, it is a day that is full of chaos and something that we just kind of have to get through. My generation has generally lost their minds when it comes to parenting, and so we do this annually because it's fun to look back gradually at the process of my going bald over the years. The whole, like the whole process of family pictures, 
at least for those with young kids, is awful. Let's all get together and wear something that coordinates, doesn't look totally goofy. Let's pray the weather works out. Hope none of our kids have attitudes, or our wives, your wives, rather. Uh, uh, that, that's what I meant, babe. Um, let, let's, let's get all the kids to smile at the same time and try to keep l- from losing our cool with one another. This year, on the way to Family Picture Day, I threatened Chase and John Michael. I told them that if I heard any complaining come out of their mouths, that we were going to have a problem. Just keep your mouths shut until the day is done, no matter how long it takes. Now, every once in a while, however, it works out. Every once in a while, you get the picture that makes the whole thing worth it. I hate to admit that, I really, really do, uh, because it, all it means is that I will continue to be dragged into the sound and fury that is my family picture day every year. But this past December, we got one. It is my all-time favorite picture of my family ever, and I don't know that it will ever be matched. Uh, this is that picture. I have it on my desktop, on my computer. Uh, And for the rest of my life, I will look back on this picture with fondness. It is a near-perfect representation of our lives. Uh, John Michael in all of his wild glory, Aniston with all of her sass, the rest of my family with all of their idiosyncrasies, my wife, the hurricane in the middle of it all, and me standing in the eye with a fake smile as if I'm holding it all together, right? This this picture uh, perfectly encompasses everything that happens in our lives. You'll notice also that it was raining in December, and it is a moment of chaos and beauty, one of a billion moments like this that happens in life every single day. All around us, there are beautiful things that are happening, while simultaneously there are horrific things that are happening, all at the same time. This past summer, we spent a week, well, four nights to be specific, up here at the church learning about building with young people and old people alike, wonderful classes, spending a great time together. It's one of the highlights of my year. In the same week, four deaths, four funerals in rather tragic fashion. Whether the storm hits us or not, it's going to hit somebody. And it's going to be beautiful somewhere while it's chaotic somewhere else. If you stop and you pay attention for long enough, you can't help but conclude that life is this ironic mix of chaos and beauty. They are occurring all around us all the time. It has been that way since the very beginning. God creates a perfect world. It is perfect in harmony and unity and beauty and relationship. And He puts man into this beautiful garden and puts a woman alongside him. And then they sin and chaos enters the world and fractures the kingdom from cosmos all the way down to the cellular level. But what's curious is that the chaos is also introduced into your own heart and your own being, because what becomes clear to us as we live is that we also are, ca- are agents of this chaos and this beauty that even among believers within the hearts and the minds of the people of God, there are competing forces that vie for our supremacy. In, in Romans 7, Paul tells us, he says, I find this law at work, although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work and within me. What a wretched man I am. Now, we're going to deal specifically with Romans 7 at a later time in this series, but Paul says, man, there is good stuff in me. There is pure desire in me. I love God's law. I want to do what's right. But at the same time, there is another law at work, and it is evil, and it is waging war against the beauty, against the good that's within me. And it is the chaos that's inside that leads to this question that I think is best represented in a verse from Job chapter 9, in which he simply says this, how can a man be in the right before God? How can a man be in the right 
How can a a sinful man stand in the presence of a holy God? Or rather, how can a holy God tolerate an imperfect man or woman? That is the question that must be answered and the problem that must be solved. It is an issue of God's holiness. And so, on one hand, God could first say, I'm just going to condemn the sinner. I'm perfect. You're a sinner. I'm not compromising my standard. You're condemned. Now, this option leaves us hopeless. Option two, God overlooks our imperfection, and He just takes us as we are. The problem with this is that it negates God being God. If He's perfect, He cannot maintain perfection while abiding with or allowing sin. And so, we need another option. And the third option, of course, is to change the sinful person into someone who is righteous. Well, we read earlier that God demonstrates His love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so, Christ will become the answer to that question. In Romans 3, we read, there is no distinction. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and they are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. God's answer to the problem of sinful man and his own holiness is the person of Jesus Christ, who He sends into the chaos and the beauty of the world and is hung on a cross as a propitiation for our sin. He justifies us. This is a key word that Paul will use all throughout Romans, the fact that we are justified. What does it mean that we are justified? It means that God looks at us and He sees us as just. He looks at us and He sees us as being right, even in all of our wrongness. He looks at us and He sees us as holy. He makes us right, Jesus does, before God. And now we are justified. And we are justified, in verse 24, as a gift. It is a gift. You know, in this merit-based existence that we live in, where we earn everything we get. We are given something we could never earn. We are justified by the blood of Jesus. Like there was nothing in us. There is nothing in us that we could do it on our own. A few weeks ago, I was driving on the road next to Top Golf. Uh, there's a curved road that runs alongside Top Golf that I had never driven on. I think it runs behind Lowe's. And I was driving on that road, Chase and I, on a Saturday morning, I believe, or on some morning, Thursday morning, I can't remember, we were driving, we were going to go hit some golf balls because, for an hour, because if there's one thing I know how to do, it's hit a golf ball. No, that's not true. Like, we were going to go hit golf balls for an hour, and when we, as, just as we pulled into the parking lot, I heard a noise, and I turned around and looked, I looked at my rearview mirror, didn't see anything, turned around, and there were, there were flashing lights, and there was a cop behind me. And so I pulled into my parking spot and parked. And he got out of his car, and he approached me, and he said, uh, license registration, and he said, uh, did you know you were, you're speeding? And I said, didn't know. And he said, you know that the speed limit on this road is 25 miles an hour. And honestly, I have no idea that it's 25 miles an hour. There was nobody on this road. I said, I'm sorry I didn't know that. He said, you were going 37. I said, okay. Uh, so I gave him my license and my registration, and he went back to his car. Meanwhile... Chase and I, were there to, we were there for like a certain deal they were dishing out between 11 and noon. And so I said, go in and get us a bay, right? And I was like, go in and get us a bay. And he's like, what? And I was like, go in, get us this deal before it runs out. Go. I, get my, I hold up my credit card, go inside. And he's hesitant, but he goes. Do what I said. Okay, so he goes inside. Cop comes back. This probably doesn't bode well for this cop's career, but he says, where was the passenger that was in your your seat? And I said, uh, I sent him inside. And he said, you're not allowed to do that. Now, honest to God, I I don't get pulled over very often, right? So I don't realize that when you get pulled over, every person in the car is now seized, okay? I told Chase, he didn't pull you over, he pulled me over, go get us a bait, right? But I didn't know that it now in that moment, every person is seized in that car, which means nobody can get out of that car. Uh, 
And so he smirks at me. Uh, he asks me when he first pulls me over why I didn't pull over when I first saw him. I did pull over when I first saw him, except he said that he had been following me for 100 yards. <laughs> but Chase and I never saw that. So in, in a, complete, a moment of total naive and maybe stupid ignorance, I have botched this whole thing. He's already mad that I didn't stop when he pulled me, like when he got behind me. He's mad that I was going 37 and a 25, and if you get pulled over for going 37, you get a ticket, that's a bad day. I mean, if I want to get a ticketed, I'm going to be going faster than 37, right? <laughs> I mean, at least let me, let me earn this, right? Let me get out on that strip for a minute. But the fact that I didn't know that it was 25 miles an hour, the fact that I didn't know that he was behind me, the fact that I did not know that my passenger had to remain in his seat, when the car was pulled over, none of those things matter. Simply, I was wrong. In my ignorance, I still was wrong. And why do I tell that story? You know, I tell that story because I think, and you might agree, I think I'm a pretty good guy. Some of you wouldn't, but like most of you, I think, would say, pretty good guy. I look around at the brokenness of the world, at the nonsense that happens every day in society, and I think, man, I'm not, I'm not like those nuts, you know? Uh, thank God that I'm not like him, and I don't participate in that, and I teach young and old people alike about Christ, and I give benevolently, and I'm raising my kids in this kind of way, but see, none of it, none of that, zero, has anything to do with why God sees me as being righteous. Truth be told... And what I know that most of you don't outside my wife and a few of my friends is that I'm a, I'm a mess. Like there is some chaos going on in here. There's fear and there's double-mindedness and there's jealousy. There's some shame and I am not justified because of how I act or because of my political party or because... I attend this church or any church. I'm not justified because of where I come from or who I was born to or because I worship in a church of Christ. I am justified because Jesus Christ hung on a cross as a sacrifice in my place. And His blood now is what God sees when He looks at me. And so He takes this chaos and beauty all wrapped into one mess and sees me still as righteous. It's the only reason that He sees me as righteous. There's nothing of myself that He looks at me and says, man, that guy's in right relationship with me. Nothing at all. It's all about Jesus. And there's a great example that we find in Scripture that kind of exemplifies this for us. It's found in Luke 18. In Luke 18, it's five, five verses long, this story we read, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Contempt, right, is the feeling that somebody else is beneath you. It's this feeling that whatever, for whatever reason, I am better than that person. So Jesus is going to tell a parable to those who trusted in themselves for their own righteousness and treated others as though those people were beneath them. Verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, if you've been in church for any significant amount of time, you have heard us beat to death the idea that tax collectors were bad dudes. I don't have time to flesh that all out today. If you want to know why they were so bad, come find me afterward. I'd love to talk with you about it, but they're about the worst of the worst. Jesus here is comparing the spiritually elite with the spiritually impoverished. Verse 11, the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. 
For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now listen to me, all you good people like me. Nothing you have ever done is worth spit to God. (laughs) Nothing. Nothing that you have ever done justifies you before the Lord. No matter how good you think you are, it counts for nothing. In Isaiah 64, we read that we have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags or like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. I'm not saying that there's no value in the good things that we do. There's value in them. There's change in them. We can give life through them. I'm saying that before God, not one single thing that I have ever done, nor the compilation of all that I have ever done, has anything to do with how He sees me as being justified. I think a lot of people have this merit-based view of salvation that sees all of our goods put on one side of the scale and all of our bads put on the other, and we're hoping against hope that on the last day, it's gonna, the good side's going to just outweigh the bad, just barely. We wouldn't mentally assent to believing that, but we live like that. Or rather, we wouldn't mentally assent to that, but we think in that kind of way. That, oh man, I'm not doing good right now. Like, my scale's not on the right side. i got to do some stuff to get it back on the right side so that God will see me as just or as righteous. My response to all the chaos out there and in here is not to look around and think, you know, I might have some stuff, but I ain't ain't like that guy. My response is simply to throw myself at the mercy of Jesus. Now, I know that there are those of you who are in right relationship with God, and you have grown morally in your time as believers. Like, I hope you have. The love of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ ought to compel good works within us. It's not the other way around. The love of Christ ought to compel me to do good things in life, to bless others and to bless even myself. It doesn't work the other way around. But we don't boast in those things because we see the big picture, right? We see the big picture that Romans would put it this way in chapter 3, that what becomes now of our boasting? It's excluded. There's no boasting. By by what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that no one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. I stand before God blameless in His sight, not because of anything I've done, but because He declares that of me. You ever notice that the only thing in the Bible that ever impresses Jesus is faith? It's the only thing that ever impresses Him. It's not the good things that people do. The woman, I believe, in Matthew 15 who comes and says, Lord, my daughter's sick. I need, I need you to heal. And he says, I've come only for the lost people of Israel. And she says, yeah, but even the dogs eat from their master's table, the, the scraps. And he says, woman, you have great what? You have great faith. He's impressed by her faith. We are justified by grace through faith. It is the only thing now that is impressing to him. I know that there are unbelievers in this room who are people that I love. (laughs) There are people in this room that I love being around. I love having conversations with you. I love that you come here. I just don't understand, frankly. Do you consider eternity ever? And if so, what does that look like? If you, if you believe in life after death, on what basis are you going? Is it because you are better than those around you? And if you are better than those around you, doesn't that, that mean that then there are other people who are better than you? And, and where does that line get drawn? Where does the line get drawn of those who are justified and who are not based on the litany of things that they have done well in life? The great news of the gospel is that you deserve to die, and I deserve to die forever despite my ignorance. I didn't know it was 25 miles an hour. I didn't know the guy had to stay in the car. I didn't know it. It doesn't matter. You broke the law. 
And when you break the law, and when you sin against an infinitely holy and eternal God, you are then worthy of infinitely holy and eternal punishment. That's kind of the, that's kind of the whole understanding around hell, this idea of it doesn't seem very just for somebody to be punished for eternity for something that they did wrong for, say, 70 or 80 years. But you know that that's not how we punish people, right? If it takes you 10 seconds to kill someone, we don't put you in prison for 10 seconds. It's about magnitude. It's about the person who is sinned against. And we stand in the presence of a holy, perfect, almighty God, completely unworthy and completely imperfect And despite all of that, He forgives our 10,000 bags of gold and pardons us and says, I see you now as righteous. This is salvation, that in the moment where it becomes clear to me that I have fallen short of the glory of God, I can look around and say, well, I'm a pretty good person. At least I'm not that guy. And that kind of self-righteousness will so delude me that I will be convinced that I will be okay in the end because of my own morality. The truth, however, is that I am simply a lousy human being. And that grates against a few of you because you don't really feel like you're lousy. You're still playing that comparison game. But it doesn't matter how good you think I am from the outside. God knows me to be a mess. And He calls me holy somehow anyway. He looks at me and calls me blameless. Me. And see, I know what I've done. And that is humbling. Now, here is this thing too. Even after you have been justified, there will be moments in life where it manifests clearly that you are aren't even all that you think you are, that there's still a whole lot that's wrong on the inside. You thought you were better than that, or you thought you were stronger than that, or you thought you were beyond those kinds of things, or those thoughts, or those feelings, or those actions, like you thought you were past it, and you will be there again. And you will either then look back and try and say, well, but I'm better than him or you will simply fall at the mercy of Christ. And why is it then that once we have been set free, once we have been justified, why is it that we continue to struggle? Well, we're going to talk about that more next week. Um, I I think that there are a lot of good things that I've done in my life. Maybe you've seen a few of them. I've done some bad things in my life, and most of you probably haven't seen those, except for a few people in here. Don't be impressed by what you think you know of a person's exterior, because you don't know their interior. I cannot, by looking at any single one of you, know what's going on inside your heart and inside your mind when it comes to morality, or faith, or any other number of things. I love you because you are one of my brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are a collective mess of people that God looks at and sees as holy, not because of anything that any of us has ever done, but because Jesus died on the cross. That's it. That is where our hope lies. And so we don't boast in the things that I've done. I'm boasting in Christ because of what He did that now puts me in this position before God. If you need forgiveness like that, if we can bless you, encourage you in any way in this moment, there will be time here while we sing for you to come to the front. And if that's not the perfect time for you, we will be around afterwards as well and you can talk to us then. I'm so looking forward to spending these next few weeks talking with you about the gospel. It's so simple. 
but it's also so complex. And that makes it beautiful. Beautiful. 